this a time for the next uh, installment in this idea which is of the universe as um, being made out of space-time space-time is the stuff it just requires you to f make a simple flip in your head so that uh, space-time is the stuff of which the universe is made and what we perceive as matter we perceive as matter uh, but it's actually disruptions in that fabric, in that space-time. Why don't we see space-time? Why can't we grab a piece of it? Because we are bubbles in the water. And a bubble cannot grab a piece of water. A bubble is defined by the water that surrounds it, but a bubble can never grab a piece of water. It can, uh, insofar as to grab means to extend your hand and to hold it, have a piece of it, between your fingers but notice that when you take a hold of something like I take hold of Bam Bam's bauble here let me just switch the light on for a second um, here's Bam Bam when I take hold of Bam Bam's bauble the very f act the very fact of taking hold of it consists of putting my hand around it and never getting to it to hold something means to stop when you get to it and to not be able to go any further. I can't get it. Now, um, the bauble is a solid object, as is my hand, so it is possible for me to squeeze it hard enough that parts of the bauble actually go into my hand and, and sort of infuse and join with it. But in terms of space and matter, you can't grab a piece of it they, as it were, deflect each other always. Just as water and air, if, well, let's imagine, uh, let's say, oil and water, bubbles of oil in water, but it's easier if we say air because we can have the analogy of the fish seeing water as nothing or us seeing air as nothing. So if we just forget, for this purpose of this exercise, that, 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 that air is soluble in water to some extent, and imagine that they are separate, that is the effect that you have with space-time. Space-time being the water, and we being the bubbles in water, if air were simply nothing, simply tension, simply uh, an energy. Okay, now then. Um, what I wanted to get on today was, was very exciting, which is the idea of energy. Uh, energy. Memories. I, I rhymed in my head there. I rhymed the words... Um, obviously in that state. Memories. I should have done this earlier. I should have done this at five o'clock when I woke up. How are memories stored? Well, I've, I've had uh, past life experiences, and you might laugh. Uh, past life memories, very strong ones. And I've gone and found, when I've gone and investigated, I've found incredible and astonishing coincidences and connections between the lives of those other people and myself. Uh, and I've also found, had historical events from uh, one of those experiences, a historical event that I knew nothing about that was there. And I later found out that it was a real historical event, um, which, if you're interested to know, was the battle between um, uh, Japan and Russia on a bridge over a river, which, you know, that's a pretty, that's a pretty obscure thing to, to, to have just pop into your head and to actually be a real thing. But anyways, uh, and other details, but I won't go into that. Now, how can it be that memories of another person can become into my head? How can it be that sometimes you dream something and then a few hours, uh, a, a few days later, perhaps later that day, bang, oh my gosh, that I dreamed that. I dreamed about that broken boat there with the... Uh, with the piece of wood that just fell over the moment I looked at it. That was in my dream. These kinds of things make more sense if instead of thinking in terms of there's one memory in here, if you think in terms of this is not a storage device for memory, but it is rather a radio set. And all the memories are imprinted in space-time. Because if space-time is the stuff, when you're going to have to look at my previous videos to understand that part, if space-time is the stuff, then every little ripple 
that goes through this radio set here in my head, this radio transmitter receiver in my head, uh, every little ripple that goes through it is going to be stored in my area of space-time, primarily in my area of space-time, but uh, by implication it is going to r ripple outwards to other areas of space-time. And just as with a, uh, a pattern, uh, a pattern that can be very clear and then it goes through various mathematical transformations and becomes completely destroyed and then a little bit further down the line suddenly comes back together almost perfectly and you find this uh, you'll see this effect uh, and, and this is an effect that I will refer to in relation to other things as well um, and I, oh God, I can't remember the, the name for it but when you're driving along and you're dri you, you, you go past a fence and the fence posts are like this and there's some there's another fence beyond it that's 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 almost the same and the interaction of these two sets of vertical lines which are not quite at the same distance and not quite at the same angle creates this amazing perfect little shape and then it repeats down there the same perfect little shape and then it repeats a little bit further along the other, the other time that you can see it is when you have uh, the, the effect that I'm talking about, because that's sort of, I'm not quite there with that, but um, it's kind of the effect. I was trying to think more about uh, where, you, where you take a, a pattern and you apply a mathematical formula to it, uh, and eventually it just becomes disrupted and disrupted and disrupted. We used to do a little thing when we were uh, boys, we used to have a piece of graph paper, and you start with a square in the middle, and then, and then you surround it by squares of a different colour, and then you surround each of those with squares of a different colour and you apply a different rule to the old square that changes colour and then the very first square I think disappears at that stage and then you start all over again and you just keep doing that and you end up with incredibly beautiful flowers and patterns and things and an element you might pop out to you and you say oh I like that, that little kind of paisley kind of uh, curlicue thing there and then it'll go, it'll vanish completely. And then you'll do several more repetitions of the rule, you know, perhaps 30 repetitions of the rule. So we're talking about unbelievable mathematical complexity when you think uh, in terms of the possibilities, the number of possibilities, that your rule has uh, held it to uh, 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 such a trajectory that uh, this pattern will appear again. But sometimes it will appear again, but one and a half times the size or something. And these are uh, geometrical calculations that our heads cannot do, um, but a simple piece of graph paper can. And, uh, and a, simple, um, a simple slab of space-time can do if it is perfect enough and it, if it is bound by perfect rules. And the reason, the only reason it would be bound by perfect rules is if Newton is correct, uh, in terms of uh, energy, uh, cannot be created or matter cannot be created or destroyed. Uh, you cannot add or subtract anything to the universe. The universe, of course, is not the universe. It is the uh, space time in which the universe resides, in which each moment of the universe resides. Each moment of the universe has its own sphere of space time which doesn't move. Movement is simply where you go from universe to universe. And as you go from point to point, you travel to a new sphere as well, a new universe as well. So every every point in the universe has its own universe, which is its, its... Sorry, there's a speck on my screen. It's annoying me. Every point in the universe has... And by point, I mean pixel. I mean smallest divisible point, smallest divisible amount, calibration. They must have those calibrations, otherwise you cannot have uniformity, and without uniformity you cannot have rules. So every calibration, every pixel, I call them pixels of the universe, I'm going to call them pixels from now on, every pixel uh, has its own universe. For each moment in time, and time also has a minimum calibration, but time, don't forget, time isn't actually a thing. So... Um, Here's the calibration of this point in the universe. And when a bubble moves from here to here, it is now looking from this point from a different viewpoint. 
and that's perceived by us as the passage of time. Now, of course, uh, the ripples, every time you have a ripple, uh, you reconstruct the shape of the, uh, of, of the sphere, of the, of the sponge, and therefore you have to create a new universe for every, every, um, every movement or every, every, <laughs> I haven't quite worked out whether, yeah, I mean, there must be movement. There must always be change between one universe and the next. Otherwise, there would never be change ever again. Uh, do you understand? So uh, if it came to a point where all the matter in the universe was moving so slowly that it didn't move to the next calibrated point, it would never move again because the, that universe and the next one would be identical. Uh, so memories, let's get back to memories because I'm not going to go over that whole thing again about movement and time, but it does require additional dimensions, probably two for the movement and two for the time. Uh, so you end up with uh, four, five, six, seven, and probably a, in order for them to interlace, I'm not sure if it requires another dimension for them to interlace. I think the extra one I've added already does that. So it could be that there are as few as seven dimensions. Could be. Anyways, we're not going to go over that. We're talking about memories and we're talking about when this radio set uh, interacts energetically with the space-time field, um, every interaction creates ripples in the space-time field and uh, anything that is stored in the neurons in here is not really stored in the neurons in here these neurons are simply uh, charging energetically statically uh, parts of space-time which surround them the space-time therefore is distorted and the longer I hold on to a memory the longer that distortion is held on to. And just as with our graph paper, if I was to burn a hole in the graph paper and start doing the patterns so that, that little area of the graph paper could never be used, it would start to have a bigger and a bigger and a bigger effect on the pattern that I'm trying to make on that graph paper. That little burning hole would have almost no difference to start with, but then as the changes happen and as you keep coming back to the hole again and again. Now this memory that I have stored in here if I'm holding on to it, if I'm going over it again and again and again, uh, I'm affecting space-time. Everything affects space-time. Every piece of energy, every piece of matter is a bubble in space-time. Every single thing, even a thought, even a thought, even a neuron firing can only do so because it is uh, pushing against the water in which that bubble lives. That bubble has been created even, perhaps. Or we say created. Manipulated is probably a better way of putting it because we know matter and energy, we can't create them, we can only manipulate them. We manipulate matter and energy as, 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 as willful beings. Powering off. Uh, thank you. And therefore, I am, as it were, carving a groove deeper and deeper and deeper the more I remember something. So there's the uh, idea of memories and the reason that they are not uh, unique to the person but memories are stored in space-time because of course everything is in space-time, everything is moving in space-time, everything exists, be appears to exist because it is a bubble in space-time and therefore a memory um, is, how can I put this? It's as if I've traced words in water. It's like writing in water with your finger. Imagine you could write words in water so quickly by pointing down into the water, uh, a lake, and you wrote words on the surface of the lake so quickly that the water didn't have time to run back in. And so for a moment, for a split second, you could look and you could see the words there. 
carved out in the water that you'd just written on the water. That's how we remember things. But, but, what we don't realise is that those words that I wrote on the water in my lifetime of memory, remembering, <laughs> that I quickly wrote on the water, and it just created those, those, those words which were just holes in the water, just grooves in the water carved by my finger to shape, form the shape of letters. What, what I am not aware of is the process that is happening as I write those words, which is happening to the water itself which is far, far um, more um, significant than the, than the words which have just vanished. The water carries on rippling back and forth and I've really changed the water by, by writing those words in the water. And that is what memories are in this theory. Memories are stored in the water, in the space-time, that just as everything is, everything exists in space-time. Everything, a thing, everything, thing. See how ethereal a word that is. Thing, things, things. That's what things are. Are wisps of gas passing through space-time. Wisps of nothing, in fact. Wisps of energy. Wisps of will passing through space-time. Uh, and the real impression is being made on the water itself, on the ocean of space-time. This bubble, this sphere of, of tightly packed ball bearings that surrounds us. And that is where the memories are actually stored. And that's why memory is unlimited. That's why memories can be shared. That's why memories can come back from the past, from other people. That's why memories can belong to a place. And that's why when you remove parts of a rat's brain, eventually the memories will come back again. And experiments were done, horrific experiments, it must be said, where they removed different parts of a rat's brain and until they had removed, through a series of rats, every conceivable part of the brain where memory could be stored. And they found that in every single example, the rat's memories came back completely and they concluded that the brain is fractal, that's to say that a piece of the brain therefore must hold the whole of the brain somehow in it, in a fractal way. But I think if you think of yourself uh, set in space-time and you have rippled into the space-time, I think it's possible uh, that the reverberations and the ripples in that water could be what bring the memories back so easily. And that this radio receiver, once it's reconstructed itself, I mean, if you've got a radio, you can take any component away from the radio, can't you? And as long as you repair the radio, the brain repairs itself, any part of the body, as long as you repair the radio, you can then start listening to Radio Caroline again. And it doesn't matter what bit you take away from the radio, as long as you repair it somehow, you can get it working again and you can listen to radio or a boat. You know, you can take any plank of wood from a boat and it may sink. As long as you get a plank of wood from somewhere, or perhaps even somewhere else on the boat, and put it back, uh, you can get the boat, you can get the thing sailing again. So, uh, in this way, uh, the uh, this makes far more sense for the rat or the brain uh, as a radio transmitter that has been repaired and is therefore able once again, uh, as long as too much time hasn't passed, memories fade with time, but of course they do because ripples get flatter with time. Uh, and it's not it's not actually an ocean it's not bouncing around but moving flat and forward it's it's uh, it's you know it's fixed around you it's pretty much your universe of space time is pretty much there around you it's so forget about the water in terms of its rippling and the ripples are dying down yes they're dying down affected by other ripples bigger ripples perhaps displaced but all in all you've got your spot and that's today done. Thank you.